All right, if you'll please take your Bibles and turn with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms. We're going to go to Psalm 65. Psalm 65. We'll find ourselves in verse number 2 again. We've talked about this for a couple of messages already. (coughs) Psalm 65 and verse 2. The Bible says, O thou, that's referring back to God in the first verse, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. And that's what we're talking about, O thou that hearest prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us now. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you that we're able to look into your word. I'm thankful that we're not looking for it anymore. Uh, We have it, and we want to rely on it. We want to believe it. We want to trust every word of it that you've given us. And uh, and I pray that you'd help us tonight. I'm asking, Lord, that that you would do with your word what only you can do, that you would speak to us, and you'd allow your word to have free course in our hearts, that uh, we might be stirred and changed and our mindset be different about prayer and about the access that you've given us to your very throne and your presence in our life. Father, help us not to take that for granted in our life. Help us find you daily in our secret closet of prayer. And may you lead and guide us, even at this moment. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We said in this uh, psalm, in Psalm 65 and verse 2, that uh, I said, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. We made two observations here, two things about prayer we said. And what the first one was is the Lord hears prayer. I know that's very simple, but we need to know that, and we need to believe that, and we need to act upon that. And uh, we know He hears prayer, but it is when we're in close fellowship with the Lord that He can hear us when we pray. And what I mean is the difference between that is Him actually answering our prayers. He hears it. He hears everything. He knows everything you say and think and do. Um, But if you want him to hear in order to answer, then we need to be in close fellowship with him because we know that it's our sin that keeps him from hearing us and answering us. And then the second thing we said was that everyone prays at some times. It said unto thee shall all flesh come. And so everybody's going to pray at some time somebody's going to need something beyond what they've ever needed before, and that's called the Lord. And uh, sometimes it takes people different things to get to that point in their life. And, uh, but everybody's going to need the Lord sometime. And so it would be good that we keep in touch and keep a good testimony before others so that when they need the Lord in a time like that, maybe they're like, I don't need the Lord, and I don't need the Lord, and I don't need the Lord. And then one day, all the circumstances come together, and they're like, I need the Lord. Are they going to look to you and say, they're going to give you a call? You know, everything's falling apart. I need the Lord. And then you get the opportunity to share with them and and pray with them and help them and show them to the scriptures. And um, there, so we ought to remember that everybody that tells us, well, we don't want anything to do with the Lord, one day, one day they might need the Lord. And so we just keep having a testimony. Uh, We just keep living for the Lord. We keep trusting Him and then let the Lord help us to help them. Now, realizing that all of us either uh, need to or are going to need to pray, then it'd be wise to know a little bit about prayer uh, there. So we're going to look at a couple more truths tonight about prayer. Um, We've already looked at uh, the fact that we have the privilege of prayer. We talked about that. It is a great privilege to come before the Creator God of this universe and that He would even desire to talk to you and me. That, that is something that goes right over my head in, in actuality. But we grasp it by faith. We grasp it by faith and we grasp it through Jesus Christ that this is true because the Lord became a man without ceasing to be God to die for us so that we could have this relationship. And I'm so thankful for that and that we can have this privilege of prayer. But we also talked about there was power in prayer. And one of the things we talked about was... Elijah, and somebody didn't pray for the rain to stop tonight, uh, or it wasn't a prayer of faith anyway, and uh, no, we still got the rain tonight coming, I'm thankful for the rain though, we can't stop it every time, then we'd be in drought, then we'd be praying for the rain, all right, Uh, but the power in prayer, there is power, but you have to be connected to the power source, 
The branch is not going to bear any fruit if it's not in the vine. The microwave is not going to work if it's not plugged into the power socket. You're not going to get that vacuum cleaner to do anything if it's not plugged in. Uh, okay, so we have to, as believers, be plugged into the Lord. It's not that we lose Him. It's that we're not abiding in Him like John told us in John 15. We need the power, the power of prayer. And so now I want to talk to you tonight. The first thing I want to talk to you about is the mysteries of prayer. The mysteries of prayer. There are things that the Lord will not do unless we ask Him to do them. That's a mystery. And you know, we wouldn't understand that if He did not reveal that to us. A mystery is something we would not understand unless God revealed it to us. There are mysteries in the Bible and He's revealed them to us through His Word, what He wants us to know. Now, I'll say that again. There are things that the Lord will not do unless we ask Him to do them. I want you to go to Matthew 6 with me. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. So let's go to verse 7. And we find Jesus telling us this truth here in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now, you understand, he didn't say you shouldn't pray. <laughs> He just said, when you do, don't do it with vain repetitions. And then he says, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So meaning you don't just pray and pray and pray and pray and say the same things over and over and over again. And think because you just prayed a whole bunch that God's going to hear you. Uh, the only way he hears us is by faith. And, uh, and we come before him and uh, let him know um, what we want there. By faith. It's not by our much speaking. The prayer doesn't have to be an hour, although those are good times if you pray for an hour and you seek the Lord and you're before His presence. But it doesn't have to be that. Um, you just need to pray in faith. Now, verse 8 says this, be, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father, that's God the Father, knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask Him. So the Lord knows what our needs are, verse 8 tells us. That's very good. Amen? He knows exactly what you need because He knows what tomorrow holds. He knows the grace that you need today. And by the way, His grace is sufficient. He has enough of it for you. And everything he, you need, He has enough of it. And everything I need, He has enough of it. But not only that, but the Lord will not meet those needs until we ask Him. The Bible says, The Father knoweth, your Father knoweth what things you have need of before ye ask Him. He already knows, but the whole thought is you need to ask Him. That's not for Him. That's for you. <laughs> he doesn't need you to ask to give us, but He will not give us until we ask because He wants your faith to be increased. This is the process that He wants you to go through. Look at James. James chapter 4. So Jesus is telling us here, about this, unless we ask him, some things he's just, he's not going to do. And then James chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, and look at this, what the Bible says, yet ye have not, because you ask not. There's the truth there. We don't have because we don't ask. So he said, when you ask, then I'll give it to you. That's why you don't have it. Let's, let's look at Romans chapter 10. You can leave your finger there in James, but in Romans chapter 10, I just want to use the illustration about salvation. Look what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So did we have to ask the Lord to save us? Yeah. Yeah. We called out on him to save us. We believed in our heart, but because we believed in our heart, we spoke something with our mouth, and we asked him. Until we ask Him, until we call unto Him, He's not going to save us. 
There's some things he's not going to do for us until we ask him. I'm convinced that a major reason we don't see answered prayer, get it, get it, it's very deep, is because there is no prayer. But if we did pray, what would God do? What if we just asked Him? Nobody else has to hear you. You can go real far out on a limb, and you can just ask God for stuff nobody else knows you're crying out to Him for, and... Uh, and just trust Him for it. You don't have to get up here in front of everybody at church and pray and uh, ask Him for this big thing and then you're all worried, what if He doesn't do it? You just ask Him in the privacy of your own home, in your prayer closet, in your time with Him. But why don't we do that? Why don't we see answered prayer? I don't think we're asking Him. So there are things that the Lord will not do unless we ask Him to do them. Now this is a mystery. <laughs> but there are things that the Lord will not do when we ask Him to do them. And I'm thankful for that. I've asked the Lord to do some things in, in the past that I'd look back and I'm like, Lord, thank you that you didn't do what I asked you to do. I'm very thankful for that uh, in my life. Now, this is what I mean. Go back to James. James chapter 4. And we just read about you have not because you ask not. And now the Lord's not going to do something for us when we ask him to do it. Now, why would that be? Well, look at James chapter 4 and verse 3. The Bible says this. Ye ask, so okay, we are doing the right thing now. Now we are asking. But look what the Bible says. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. So the Lord will not do things that we ask Him if they are asked for selfish reasons. If they're asked because of the lust of your flesh then we shouldn't expect to receive those things of the Lord. What we need to do is ask in His will. When we start asking things outside of God's will, He's not going to give us those things. And if He does, watch out. Because maybe He's just giving them to you to prove something. Um, there. I want you to go to John 14 with me. John 14. So we're going to see some things about asking in the Lord's will. In the Lord's will. Because if we ask outside of the Lord's will, He's not going to do it. In John chapter 14, look at verse 13 and 14. Of course, Jesus is speaking here and He says this, And whatsoever ye ask in My name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now I want you to notice here when he says in my name, because up to this point, they're not asking things in Jesus' name, but he's saying when I'm gone, they don't understand all this, but he's saying when I, go, when I die, when I'm buried, when I'm gone, when I ascend back up to heaven, you're not going to have me anymore. Then you're going to ask the Father for things and you're going to say it in my name. You're going to ask for it. That's why we finish the prayer and we say in Jesus' name. We're asking His name. Now, what does that mean? I've come to the conclusion that that means this is Jesus' will. That's why we ask in His name, because we're asking something that we believe is God's will in a, in a matter. So we, have, we can come in Jesus' name and ask that. Look at chapter 15 of John and verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Again, he's saying you're going to ask in my will, you're going to ask in the, the Father's will, and he's going to give it to you. Look at chapter 16 of John, in verse 23 and 24. Again, Jesus is still speaking here. As far as I understand, all of this that we're reading right here, all this takes place in with the same people in the same setting or as they're walking or as they're going somewhere. It's all at the same time. Then he says this in verse 23, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto, that means up to this point, have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Now see, he said that asking was for them. 
It wasn't for the Lord. It wasn't for the Father. It was for them that their joy might be full there. And so when we ask in Jesus' name, it is the same as asking the Lord for Jesus' will to be done. So if we're not going to ask in Jesus' name for his will to be done, then why do we expect for the Lord to give it to us? Unless we're part of that group of people who have now think that we can manipulate the Lord and tell him what he has to do for us because now we are over him somehow. And there are groups of people that will teach you that and tell you you can tell God whatever you want and he's going to give it to you. And uh, that's not the God of the Bible. And, uh, and I, don't, I wouldn't advise you to do that. Tell God what he has to do. Now, if it's biblical, then we can go to God with the promise. We can go to God with his truth, and we can trust God that he's faithful, and he'll help us. Now, prayer requests are like checks that have two signatures. We must sign it with our desire or our will. Right? We bring a prayer to God, and it should be our desire and our will, but the Lord must sign it with his desire and his will. That's what we need. The Lord wants to, uh, us to be at a place in our lives that when we do pray that we will not ask for anything that he can't sign off on. Right? If we're praying the way the Lord wants us to pray, then the Lord can just sign right off on that and say, yeah, I'm going to put my name to that too. And it'll be done. This is a mystery. The mysteries of prayer. He'll, he won't give us some things until we ask him, and then there's some things we ask him for that he's not going to give us. It's a mystery. Now, the responsibility of prayer. Every privilege comes with a responsibility. And we already said this is a privilege that we have to go to prayer. It's got power. It's a mystery. But the responsibility of prayer. The privilege of prayer comes with the responsibility to pray for others. To pray for others. You don't have entrance into God's throne to be selfish. Now, we do want to come into God's presence, and we should go into God's presence for more than things. Or asking for things. We should go into God's presence seeking God. Being with God. Nothing else attached. We get to enjoy that. But what we can also do is we get to go to prayer for each other. Because I have access. And you have access. And now we have a privilege to do that. And a responsibility to do that. You have something in your life. I need to help you bear that burden. And I need to be praying with you about it. Look at uh, 1 Samuel with me, chapter 12. You'll remember that Samuel was a prophet here. And uh, he was, he's making this statement we're going to find in uh, verse 23 of 1 Samuel chapter 12. And the Bible says, Moreover, as for me, Samuel speaking, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord. Now, he's about to tell you that if he doesn't do this thing, that he's sinning against God. Now, what is it that he's sinning in? in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things He hath done for you. He said, if I'm not praying for you, then, then I'm sinning. That's the privilege he had. He got to talk to God. And he got to pray for the people. He got to go to God on behalf of the people, and then he got to go on behalf of God to the people. What a great responsibility that Samuel had. His responsibility to pray for Israel as one of their leaders. Now, Paul often reminded others that he prayed for them, and he requested others to pray for him. We find that because what he realized is, hey, I have a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And you do too because you know Christ now. These are churches that He's getting planted. Most of the people He led to the Lord. And He knows them and He's saying, we're praying for you, pray for us. You have a responsibility to pray for me and I have a responsibility to pray for you. Let's look at some of those. In Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, the Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is, is that they might be saved. He said, I have a responsibility. Israel, they're my brethren according to the flesh. He was a Hebrew. He was of the Israelites. And so 
He said, my heart's desire, what I'm praying, is they'll be saved. What do you think God's heart was? That Israel be saved. He was praying in God's will. But he said, I'm praying, I have a responsibility now, and that responsibility is that I pray for them that they be saved. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11. He says, Ye also helping together by prayer for us. That's him and those that were traveling with him on these missionary journeys. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. He said, You're helping together by prayer for us. You have a responsibility, and you help us, but you help us through prayer. Don't think that your prayers aren't needed for our missionaries. They're needed. We help them through our prayers. We help them through finances, but we, we help them through prayer. Well, look at chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 9 and verse 14. And by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. So, talking about praying for each other. Then we get to chapter 13 and verse 7. He says, Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. So he said, I'm praying to God that you do no evil. He was praying for them. He was letting them know again. Now we come to Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and verse 18, this is that closing remarks here about when we talk about the whole armor of God. And in verse 18, which I think is still part of the armor of God, praying, being part of it. And um, we find in verse 18 that he says this, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. That's all your brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to be praying for each other because there's a spiritual battle taking place and we need the Lord to help us, to persevere, to move through, to be victorious in this battle that we're facing. He said pray for each other. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 4, he said this to the Philippian church, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. He says, I'm remembering you. I'm praying for you. This is a responsibility I have. I helped you guys come to know the Lord. I brought the message. You believed. Now I'm praying for you. Verse um, 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He's telling them how he's praying for them. In verse 19, he says this, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So he said, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, you're praying for me. Then we have in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He said, we're praying for you. By the way, these are some great prayers he's telling him he's praying for. And these are some powerful prayers um, that we could take and implement in our lives and pray for others that way. In chapter 4 of Colossians, in verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. He said, pray for us. Continue in prayer. Don't stop praying for us. This is your responsibility. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Chapter 5 and verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. You can memorize that tonight. Brethren, pray for us. He said, I'm praying for you. Pray for me. 
Pray for us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Paul thought there was a responsibility to come along with this privilege of prayer. Samuel told us, hey, I'm going to sin if I don't pray for you. Then Paul said, hey, I'm praying for you. Then he'd throw in there, pray for us. Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, pray for us. Continue in prayer for us. We're praying always for you when we pray. Pray for us. Remember us. He sounded like he needed it, and he believed that he could pray for them and that it was going to help them. And he said, I want you to pray for us because it's going to help us. It was a privilege, but it was a responsibility that needed to be carried out. I want you to go to Acts chapter 12 with me. Acts chapter 12 with me. And we'll see what's taking place here. As Peter was in prison, and uh, it wasn't a very good situation. He was waiting to be executed. So we have Peter here in Acts chapter 12. And um, we find him here in the prison. Now, we're not going to read all the verses, but we're going to read some of them. And in verse 5, look what we find. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So they were praying without ceasing for him. That was their responsibility. Then we come to verse 7 through 11, and we're not going to read it, but we, what we find here is the Lord sent an angel to wake him, Peter, up, and to walk him right out of the jail. Doors open, walks out, and he walks to the very place where the church is gathered, and they're praying for him. Now, when we come to verse 12, look what we find. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came and hearkened named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is an angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and how he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now what's happening here? The believers at John Mark's house did not believe Rhoda. Hey, we're praying in here. We're having a prayer meeting. What are you bothering us for? We're, can't you see we're praying to the Lord about Peter in jail? Yeah, he's here at the door. No, no, that must be an angel. That'd be pretty awesome, right? <laughs> the angel's at the door. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe they just saw angels all the time at their door. Kind of sounded like it was normal, but I, I doubt they did. But maybe it's an angel knocking. We're praying for Peter. <laughs> he's in jail. He's about to be executed. We're praying for him. No, he's at the door. You see what's happening? Can you imagine that? In response to a group of Christians fulfilling their responsibility to pray, even though they do not appear to expect the Lord to answer them, a preacher was delivered from death row. Now, they might have thought the Lord was going to answer them, but it's, they really seem to have doubted that he was actually out at the house at that time. No, no. No, not the Peter we're praying for. He's not here. Now, we should not be amazed when the Lord answers prayer. We should not be amazed. That should be the normal thing for a believer. I'm afraid it's not the normal thing for Christianity as a whole because there's a bunch of unbelievers within Christianity. But even amongst the believers that are spread throughout Christendom, it, it just cannot be the normal thing to see answered prayer. Not the way people live, not the way people act, not the way things happen. It just can't be the normal thing in their life. 
But, you know, we should be astonished. This is what we should be astonished at. If the Lord does not answer prayer. Our mindset should be completely different. The world says, the Lord's not going to answer your prayer. We should say, well, I'm going to be shocked if he doesn't answer my prayer. That should be our faith. To believe God and ask him for what only he can do. It is a responsibility that we have to pray, and it's a mystery. And we need to get in on that mystery. We need to ask what he wants for, for us, because he's not going to give us when we're asking against his will for our life. Prayer is an awesome privilege. Prayer is powerful force. Prayer is a mysterious thing. Prayer is a sacred responsibility. And prayer is something that every person is eventually, they're going to realize they need it. So we don't need to wait until we're desperate. <laughs> we need to go ahead and pray now. We need, to, we need to set aside time to start praying now. Get close to God now. Because we don't want to try to get close to Him when something happens. We just need to... All, that was never how He designed it. We're to already be walking with Him, and when something happens, we're still walking with Him. And we still find Him just as faithful as when nothing was happening that we thought was bad in our life. And this is what the Lord wants for us. O oh, thou that hearest prayer. That's our God. He hears us. He wants to hear us. Father, thank you for hearing us tonight. I believe you in heaven and in inside of each one of us as believers here tonight. You hear us. And it is not because of anything we've done. It's all because of your son, Jesus Christ. We can come boldly because of his shed blood. And we do tonight. We pray that you'd help us in the hardened parts of our hearts that won't pray like we ought to, won't believe you like we ought to. Would you help us tonight? Lord, would you, would you soften our hearts to receive the things that you're trying to do, to believe your word where you speak in your word, to trust your promises, to trust your faithfulness to us. Help us not to trust others, but to trust you. Would you guide us in this thought tonight in our hearts? Lord, we want to be on the right side of that mystery and praying in your will for the things that you put in our hearts to do. Please help us to pray for each other. Help us to spend time with you in our personal place of prayer. We have access. Please help us to take advantage of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Why don't you go ahead and stand? Make it easier to come to the altar if you'll go ahead and stand. Not if you're lost, but anybody, all of you, stand. We're going to stand up. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. And you need to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have no access to the throne tonight. You say, if I will, how's God going to hear my prayer? He'll hear you when you believe in your heart and you call on him for salvation. He's going to hear that prayer. He's going to hear you. And he's going to answer it because he's faithful. He's faithful. And he'll save you tonight if you need to be saved. He's done everything for you to be saved. Just like prayer. He's done everything for you to have a prayer relationship with him. There's nothing that you do everything he's done, that we can come boldly. Now, believers, are you on praying ground? I mean, have you confessed your sin? Are you yielded to him? Are you trusting him tonight? Uh, are you as clean as you can be with him? Then he can hear you, meaning he can answer your prayers, if that's how it is. Now, if you want to play around with the Lord and you're not going to get right with God, then don't expect him to answer your prayers. I mean, that's not, that's not a true understanding of who God is. He's not, he's not your gracious grandpa that you, that you walk all over during the week and then you need something and you go to him and, and, you, and you get something from him. That's a misrepresentation of who the Lord is from the word of God. Are you being an example to those that, that do not believe 
so that when they need to hear about the Lord, they have somebody to go to? Can they turn to you? Do you see prayer as necessary? Do you see prayer as a responsibility? Then we ought to be praying. Then we ought to be praying. What do you need to tell the Lord right now? You have access. You have access. I think we forget it sometimes. And the devil's so good at getting us distracted with the busyness of this life that we forget about the access that we have to the Father. And then he causes us to stumble because we spend more time in distraction than in the presence of God in our life. It's hard to admit but we've got to admit it if, you, if you're ever going to get help, if you're ever going to get in the place where you ought to be in prayer. You're going to have to make a place. You're not going to accidentally fall into it. We want to go move forward as a church. We're going to have to go to the one that hears prayer. That's how it's going to work. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for how you spoke to our hearts. Father, we should not take that lightly at all. It is a miracle that you would speak to us tonight and guide us by your word. Help us to say yes to you as you've spoken to us. Help us not to harden our hearts and say, no, no, Lord, we don't need that. We're good. Please help us not to do that. Please help us to draw a little closer to you in our communion and our walk with you, Lord, you are worthy. You're worthy of our all. Would you help us tonight to give that to you and yield to you tonight? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.